Hey everybody, we're coming at you live from here in the European Parliament in Brussels, where lawmakers are preparing to vote on a new renewable energy law for the EU next week. The proposal could fundamentally change the market for biofuel in Europe. Now, some say the change is necessary to address sustainability concerns, but others say it is too far-reaching and will make it impossible for the EU to meet its renewable transport targets. So perhaps not surprisingly then, MEPs here in the Parliament have submitted thousands of amendments to the proposal. As we get closer to the vote, I'm joined here today by Niels Torvalds, a Finnish Liberal member of the Parliament's Environment Committee, which will be taking the vote next week, and Emmanuel Despachon from Renewable Ethanol Association ePure, who is warning about the possible unintended consequences of the legislation. Now, this is a Facebook Live. We want to take your questions for these two men on this controversial subject. So please write your questions in the comment section below this video, and I'll be reading them here on my laptop, and I can ask them in real time. So, Emmanuel, let's start with you. You guys are obviously following this legislation very closely. Why do you think so many amendments have been submitted? Well, thanks for the question. And clearly, there's been a lot of interest in getting the uh, EU renewable energy policy right. Um, after the US withdrawal of the Paris Agreement, um, the European Union ambitions to be a, a leader in tackling climate change. But frankly, uh, when it comes to decarbonizing transport, the Commission proposal falls short of that ambition. Specifically for biofuels, the Commission is using a blunt instrument, allow me to say the word chainsaw, instead of a pair of scissors. Um, they're phasing out the good biofuels, like the uh, European renewable ethanol that I represent, together with the bad ones like palm oil. And in doing so, uh, simply works against the uh, European goals of reducing carbon emissions in transport, of favoring the uptake of renewables in transport. And I think MEPs across all political groups are making this clear. And this is why there is so much interest in this, uh, in this piece of, uh, of legislation. Well, Niels, let me ask you, when you first saw the Commission's proposal, what was your first reaction? Did you also have some of these concerns? My first reaction was that, oh, here we go again, because I had been in charge of the ILOOK file three years ago, yeah. so uh, all the issues were actually more or less the same, except for one. Technology goes uh, forward, and some of the technologies are actually developing with substantial speed. And that creates a problem because we had an intention to build some sort of stability for the industry. And, uh, and I think Emmanuel is right in this concern. At the same time, we have to open up for new technologies and to do this in a decent and a law-abiding way is not always very easy. So that, that was probably my first reaction. And if I say that, yeah, well, that was all my, all, also my last reaction, <laughs> then you are probably reading sort of where we stand. So your position has pretty much stayed the same from that first reaction? Yes and no. Uh, we have some big issues in the law, and then we have a lot of technical issues. Uh, you don't want to go into them, uh, nobody wants to go into them, but we, ha we have to be able to, uh, to handle them. So in the background you have the question of stability for the industry, that's also something which is uh, dynamic, because the industry also develops. Uh, then you have uh, the political situation in the world where we know that, sorry for being frank, after Donald Trump, we don't know where the states are going. So we, we are, in a way, more concerned that who is keeping up with Paris 21, COP 21, if, if, we, are, if we are alone. Can we do it? So yeah. I think we have a lot of di very different and, frankly speaking, very interesting concerns here. Well, Emmanuel, let me ask you. Obviously, the proposal was put forward uh, for a variety of different reasons, but one of them is concerns that we've heard about changes in land use cultiva cultivation, the displacement of fuel crops, what that can, you know, the, the unintended consequences that some biofuels have resulted in. Um, what is your take on that? I mean, isn't the legislation necessary to alleviate some of those concerns? Well, and clearly, I mean, if there are concerns, they need to be addressed. But as Niels uh, has already pointed out, uh, 
these concerns were the reason for the last revision of the Renewable Energy Directive uh, that, was, that lasted from 2012 to 2015, which the Member States are still implementing. Okay, so talking about stability of the policy framework, we are yet again on a, on a pattern of changing the rules of the game. Um, but, so these concerns were raised and they've been addressed as part of the last revision. Uh, the EU at, at the time decided to cap uh, the contribution that coal-based biofuels could make towards the uh, renewables uh, obligation in transport. And frankly, we didn't like that compromise at all. Uh, but typically a good compromise uh, in Brussels leaves everybody unhappy. So from that perspective, it was an excellent compromise. <laughs> it had the merit to exist. Uh, so, and we believed at the time that this would pave the way for actual stability uh, of the policy framework. But there was also something else. In that particular revision, Niels, uh, you've put a clear mandate on the European Commission to come up with a proposal for a stable, long-term policy framework that would incentivize the biofuels with high greenhouse gas savings and low risk of adverse impact. And the Commission has simply ignored that. They've decided to just do away with all the biofuels that could have unintended consequences. From where we stand, we believe that if these concerns are still there, what we need to do is, instead of punishing all the biofuels and paint them with the same brush, we need to have more stringent sustainability criteria to incentivize better performance, because then we will make the necessary investment to deliver in that respect. Mm. Diaz, what do you say to that? Are, is the risk that we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater here? Well, politics sometimes, <laughs> sometimes do that. But in the background, you have what happened 2007, 2008. If you look at the, the corn future prices on the, on the Chicago market, then all of a sudden uh, the corn price skyrocketed. And some of the conclusions from this skyrocketing of, of, of corn price was that, oh, everything is going into, into ethanol. And that wasn't actually true, but it created a political reaction. So uh, when you look at the figures, deeper into the figures, you see that, yes, some reasons for higher corn prices were uh, 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 caused by, by ethanol, but some of them were actually financial speculations. Or, uh, so, uh, but that actually changed the, poli the, the policy environment. So all of a sudden, every, every, almost everybody here started to speak about uh, we making uh, ethanol out of what people should be able to eat. And th all of a sudden you had a very moral, or you could say moralistic issue on the, on, the, on the table. And moralistic issues are sometimes very hard for politicians to, to handle because you, you tend to try to be the nice guy and saying yes to all moralistic issues. I'm not that type, but that's another qu question. So, so with this background, and a sort of what we could probably call a cultural lag in the political environment. We lag behind what's actually going on, and therefore we tend to make decisions too late or sometimes on grounds that are not technologically neutral. And that's another very interesting point. Mm. But, but if I may, on this one, I mean, uh, MEPs are now informed. Uh, the, the European Commission has an obligation to report every two years on the impacts of the biofuels policy. When it comes to ethanol, it has found that the impact of, uh, of European ethanol or the European biofuels uh, policy on food prices when it comes to ethanol is, I quote, negligible. And, and there is another element uh, to it as well. I mean, not only, uh, first, I mean, we are uh, in our industry virtually using only crops that are grown in Europe where there is no deforestation or land grabbing. I don't dismiss those concerns, but we just have to be able to separate or introduce a bit of nuance in our biofuels policy to separate uh, the good from, from the bad. But the other element is also that if you phase out the European biofuels, like it's proposed by the European Commission, you're also phasing out the co-production of animal feed that comes with it. And that will also have an, an impact, and that means more dependence on uh, protein meals imported from uh, South America as well, for instance. And here we tried to find a solution where we could go into uh, the amount of greenhouse gases, uh, so the ILUC factor, just to be able to judge what's the displacement. Is there a real displacement or is there a imagined mm -hmm. displacement? 
but in the background here, you are also another concern, uh, and that's that's the knowledge that 2030 or 2040 there will be about nine billion human beings on the planet, mm -hmm. and we must therefore also take to, into account our possibilities to 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 have food for those nine mil, uh, billions, and we already know by na now that we have. We have starvation in some parts of, of that's not you poor's fault, of course, but we, we have a problem here. So what, what we from the political side are trying to do, we are trying to balance things that are, well, we can say hardly balanceable. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's what politics, politics is all about. Well, I want to take a question from uh, Facebook viewers, Bruno. He asks, what about next generation biofuels, the ones that don't force us to choose between fueling our cars and eating? Yeah. This is the crux of the debate, of course. Do the, would a cap on biofuels, would the end of these subsidies actually result in good biofuels going away? Uh, but part of that issue is, what is a good biofuel? How do you define it? Isn't that the, the tricky thing, like Bruno was suggesting? Yeah, so I would disagree with Bruno that actually uh, the, the, that when it comes to crop-based biofuels, you actually have to make a choice between food and fuel, but we've just addressed that. Uh, now, let's be clear. We are supportive of so-called advanced biofuels that are made of waste and residues uh, and the likes. Um, I think they have a valuable and growing role to play. Uh, now, where will the investment in these advanced biofuels come from? Okay. And that is very important because you need a stable policy framework to, ha to attract investment. Okay? And what you cannot do is tell those investors in the co-based uh, biofuels, thanks very much for having invested as a direct response to our policy call. Now we're going to shut you down, but please do invest now in facilities for advanced biofuels. Okay? And that is where really the balance has to be striked by the politicians to make sure that the investments that have been made can run and incentivize more investment into uh, cellulosic ethanol where, when it comes uh, to our industry. Well, Niels, do you think if, if first-generation biofuel was totally phased out, would second-generation biofuel still receive investment? I think we have a, a psychological issue here because if, uh, and Emmanuel is, I think, right in at least one respect. If the investors think that the stable, uh, that we have an unstable environment uh, uh, in regarding biofuels in general, uh, then they might be very hes hesitant to, 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 to uh, invest. And therefore, we try to be very careful with what is called grandfathering clause. Mm -hmm. That if you are in, in the production, then you should be able to be there in the production for a certain uh, uh, time. And therefore, when the Commission came out, instead with 7% as a cap on first-generation biofuels with a 3.8 cap on biofuels, then they actually changed the environment. They actually changed the, the, the environment in which the first-generation fuel producers worked. So they, that, that created one problem. And then the second part of it, Bruno's question is, what is next-generation the new uh, biofuels, because that's, yes, we have second generation biofuels. At the same time, we see technological pro, uh, process going in a certain direction, uh, algae, uh, bacteria, but we don't, they are not yet Mature. on a scale where you can use them. So where are the different so paths of different technologies going? Uh, and we just have to, that's guesswork for our part. But, but, but fundamentally, I mean, I think the goal should be on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so this is why from that perspective, I mean, in the first uh, generation ethanol uh, industry, we already save 67% uh, uh, emissions compared to fossil. And we don't see why we could not participate to the effort. And the, fundamentally, the perverse logic of the proposal uh, of, by the Commission is that it plays the renewable energy sources against uh, themselves. And, and the only winner in that is actually fossil fuel. So yeah. we need more ambition. I, well. think, I think you have a point uh, because what you see is oil companies sort of going from fossil oil 
into the first generation, trying to find technological solutions going into second generation, mm -hmm. probably heading for a third generation. And our ability to keep this sort of process going, yeah. going on is, of course... I want to take one last question before we close from another Facebook audience member. This is a question from Mark. He asks, how will you enforce the new rules and what happens if some states ignore the rules? So what kind of, I mean, even the most ambitious piece of legislation, how are you going to enforce it? Well, this is the eternal question in the European yeah. Union because you have very different cultures. If you would ask a Finn or a German about how we... How, what we do with, with the decision, we start to implement it because that's in our backbone. If you go to some other culture, then uh, the same decision is actually the starting point for, the dis for a discussion about how to do it. So uh, the implementation is always very hard and it actually requires from the Commission a fairly stern approach that as soon as you see that somebody is cutting the corners, doing something they shouldn't be doing, then then they should step in. Manuel, do you see any problem with enforcement? Well, I think, I mean, it is obviously the job of the European Commission. What, what, what worries us is that the Commission has uh, systematically changed the goalpost over the last years. And in this last revision, when, when they, uh, in the last revision, they actually proposed a cap on crop-based biofuels towards a target. Okay, the target has to be uh, met by the member states by 2020. And now they're proposing to reduce the cap, but they also propose to eliminate that target. I think at a bare minimum, the, these, the wisdom of the members of the European Parliament should be to say the target of 2020 is there to be complied with. And then we can even discuss about a 2030 target, but at least if you want to reassure investment that actually it's more than just a piece of paper when it's a directive, then the 2020 targets need to be enforced and they need to be a baseline for future decisions. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Obviously, this is a debate that's going to rumble on in the halls of this right. parliament until next Monday when the vote is happening in Strasbourg. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And be sure to continue interacting with us as we continue discussing this topic. Okay. Thanks.